Now, there's a note sheet that's provided for you, and if you'll look with me, I'm going to ask that you look back at what we have already covered to set the table for us of what we need to look at. The Axiom 1, I'm going to read back through in order for us to look at Axiom 2 as to how elect exiles journey in this world to the celestial city of the majesty and glory of Christ. And what are those ways that we are to live? Look with me, if you would, in verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought or is being brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from that feudal way inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The grass withers and the flower fades. By God's grace and mercy, may this his word be preached for you, which abides forever. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, here we are in this wonderful text of Scripture that gives us our axiom number two, the second axiom as to how we live as elect exiles in this world. Interestingly, before you come to it, there was a time uh, where Christianity was expanding, not just by addition and multiplication, but geometric expansion was taking place. And one of the church fathers that was living at that time was Tertullian. He recorded how during that same time when the church was expanding, that believers were under intense persecution. In fact, they were made spectacles for entertainment as they were fed to lions, decapitated, put on posts, burned alive. It was amazing the ways that had been invented to try to stamp out Christianity, yet it continued to gloriously expand throughout the Roman Empire and then beyond. And there were many things that are noted in Tertullian's writing. He was a great pastor, a great preacher, a great apologist, a great evangelist. There were many things that were noted in his writings as he recorded this expansion and, and the persecution against believers. Many, many things that he recorded uh, that are, real, are interesting. He also recorded the bold witness of believers. He also recorded how they extended love and showed love to everyone, how they were actually pulling children unwanted that were just thrown into the river, that there was the deaconesses of the church, the servant women of the church who actually positioned themselves to fish these children out and would raise them in homes. Um, women who, when their husband died or their, and the uh, son had no longer taken care of them, they were just left to die but the church would bring them in and nurture them. And many other things that was notable in their extended love, showing the gospel in their love throughout the community. But Tertullian of pointed fact wrote this, the world remarked, and I quote, marveled at how they loved one another. While the love to others was there, gospel ministries of mercy and justice and all of those things were taking place, and a bold witness for Christ was everywhere, what he noted was the notation of the world. 
They marveled at how they loved one another. Why? And why did that create such a marvel? And what kind of love is that? Now, I'd like for you to keep that in the back of your mind as we back up just a minute, because as we look at a text, remember the text, if it doesn't have the context, can easily become a pretext. So we want to keep the text in the context. Peter has identified us with a very specific term as believers. He has identified us as elect exiles. Now, the Bible gives multiple titles for us as Christians. For instance, one, Christians, little Christ. Another is disciples of Christ. Another is people of the way. Another is saints. Another is sinners saved by grace. There are multiple. Another is ambassadors. Another is the sent ones. Another is the called one. There are multiple identifying statements about believers, but Peter's statement, he calls us elect exiles. It's interesting that Martin Luther, who I confess can be given to hyperbole from time to time, but Martin Luther, when he commented on this book, 1 Peter, he made the comment that almost everything you ever need to know Christ, make Christ known effectively, faithfully, and persistently is in this book. Because this book is devoted to tell you the foundation of the Christian life, the formation of the Christian life, and the motivation of the Christian life, and he uses this phrase, you are elect exiles, you are resident aliens, you are sojourners, you are pilgrims on a journey. Just like the he, and he draws the comparison Peter does throughout the epistle, just like the, the old covenant people were delivered from the bondage of slavery and then girded up their loins to go into the wilderness to come to the promised land. So your Savior, not Moses, but your Savior, this new covenant Messiah has redeemed you from the slavery of sin, and now you gird up the loins of your mind and you follow me into this sin-cursed, desolate world, and I'm going to bring you through it as sojourners and exiles into a promised land of a new heavens and a new earth. It's clear this book became quite the inspiration for a well-known piece of literature written by John Bunyan. It's called Pilgrim's Progress. And there's much that it serves almost like a commentary on this epistle. And I'd encourage you, perhaps as families, that might, might be something you want to do while we're in First Peter, is to go back and read through Pilgrim's Progress as a family, because it's much of a commentary on this uh, marvelous epistle. And so what he has just said to us by calling us elect exiles, he just told us who we are in Christ, that God has saved us, that we are Christ-secured as His inheritance, and He is securing us for the inheritance He is keeping for us. In fact, He takes, he takes time to give us an unbelievable sentence in the original uh, manuscripts that starts at verse 3, and the sentence goes 178 words till you get to verse 12. And in it, He gives praise to God for our great salvation. And then, after giving praise to God for our great salvation, as the elect of God is secured by the electing grace and love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who has sprinkled us clean and sanctified us and sealed us by the presence of the Holy Spirit, now, he says, here is your life, exiles. Here's what it means to be a resident alien. And he lays out a series of commands that start in chapter 1, verse 13, and go all the way through chapter 5. We are walking through all of those commands. But by the way, notice something. He never gives us commands of what we do for Christ as exiles until He tells us who we are in Christ as the elect. Always does. He he does what Paul does. He tells you who you are in Christ. Why? Because you and I have this streak of pride and arrogance within us that if he gave the commands first, we would think what we do with the commands is what enables him to save us. The reality is we can't save ourselves and we can't do anything to enable God to save us. We are dead in our sins. 
God saves us through the glorious, sovereign, sufficient work of Jesus Christ and because of his electing grace before the foundation of the world that has been secured at the cross and applied by the Spirit of God, now he says, now you're ready to live for me. Now what's really interesting, exile, resident aliens, I've talked to some of our, uh, it's a great blessing to meet all of our international members and attendees here at Briarwood, and I've talked with many of them that are on visas and, and, um, <clears throat> and green cards and, and all of that. Well, whenever you go, whenever you're a resident alien in a nation, whenever you do that, that nation and its authorities tell you what you do and what you can't do. That's what happens. Now, Christians, of course, by nature of what God calls us to be, we're supposed to be submissive to the authorities that are over us. So we certainly understand that. But Peter says, you're a citizen of a bigger kingdom. You're a citizen of a king over all the kings. And so we as resident aliens do not go to the nations where we live to tell us what we're permitted to do. We certainly are good citizens with the law of the land, unless that law tells us to transgress the commandments of our God and our King. Then we must obey God rather than man. But how we live as resident aliens is not defined by the authority of the nation where we reside, but by the authority of our King who tells us, here's how you live. And his very first commandment, I called it axiom number one, how do, you, how do you live in a sin-cursed world effectively, faithfully, persistently, and uh, productively for the glory of God and be filled with the joy of the Lord in a broken world, knowing that everything that can happen to an unbeliever in a broken world can happen to you except the condemning judgments of God? We get sick. We die. We lose jobs, business fails. We're located in regions where hurricanes strike and tornadoes come. And in this world, we face all of these that our God is using to perfect us and to grow us in grace in the midst of all of these trials and situations. But how is it that we are to live? How is it that we're to be ready to live with a point, with pointing, with our lives pointing to Christ in the midst of a sin cursed world. How do we do that? Well, he says, here's how you do. First of all, you know who you are by his electing grace. That's why he gives you that glorious statement from verses, chapter 1, verses 3 through 12 first. Now, with that foundation, now here's what you do based upon that foundation. And the very first thing is this, is a divine summons to a persistent, a personal, persistent, pervasive journey of holiness. A, a personal commitment. He, did you read, did you listen when I read it. It said this, be ye holy in all of your conduct as I am holy holy. Now, you don't do this to be saved. You already have a positional holiness that is perfect. Jesus' blood has wiped away your sins, and Jesus' righteousness stands on your behalf. So, you have a positional holiness, but because you have that, now in praise to God, in love to God, in thanksgiving to God, you begin to pursue a personal holiness which says, I am his, he is mine, he has my life. Jesus is not at the top of the priorities of my life. Jesus is my life. I'm pursuing holiness. And this Jesus is the one that sets the priorities of my life. That I want to follow him, whether I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, I want to do all to the glory of God. Not to be saved, not to enable him to save me, not to enable him to keep me saved, but because he saved me, because he's keeping me, because he indwells me. Now, I want to pursue that. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do that through a prepared mind. 
That's what he just said. Having prepared your mind, being sober-minded, now what? He said, with a prepared mind, number one, fix your hope on the grace that God is bringing to you when Jesus comes back at the revelation of Christ. Fix your hope right there. In other words, your present occupation of your present occupation of pursuing holiness is founded upon your ultimate destination of being with Christ and Christ coming for you. And not, let me put it this way. Your Christ-secured destination that you're looking toward becomes the foundation for your Christ-exalting present occupation. That's what gives me direction and motivation, knowing where I'm going out of the electing love of Christ and the grace that is right now being brought to me. And then not only that, the second thing that you do with your mind is you purpose your mind to, um, to go ahead and assassinate sin in your life, to kill the old man every day. We had these former way of living in which it was all about me, so every day I want to get up and kill the old man. Every day, I remember one time when the, when the pastor, and it just, I just put something into my life, I'm somewhere between zero and 100% effective in living it out, but I tried to put this into my life, which before I get out of the bed and go to the place, the chair where I have my time with the Lord, before I ever do that, laying in the bed, I try to say two things. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you. I am saved. I am saved by your grace and for your glory. Thank you. I didn't deserve it. I wasn't even looking for it, but you looked for me, and you provided the merits for my salvation through your son, Jesus. The second thing is, God, would you help me kill myself today? I would like to be the sworn assassin of all the ruling lusts that used to dominate my life. Would you let grace dominate me today? So help me kill him. Help me kill them before they kill me or my marriage or my witness or my ministry. Just help me kill it today. Before I get out of this bed, just help me kill it. In other words, here's what the Bible is saying. Help me kill me today. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. That's the way Paul put it. The life you live, you're living, but to live, you got to die. And you die to yourself, you die, you kill yourself in order to live unto Christ. And the third thing he says in the text is that you also live in the fear of the Lord during your exile. That's the fear of the Lord in which you see God in all of his glory, and that's the beginning of wisdom. God, in this unbelievable joy, in this unbelievable calling, in this great vocation that you've given to me, give me the reverence that I am under the eye of a thrice holy God. This judge of all is my Father. I am his, and he is mine. His son has died for me. His spirit now resides in me. Help me walk with that reverence and majesty, always before me, guiding my joy in your presence. Well, that's axiom number one. What is axiom number two? Now we're finding out why Tertullian said what he said. Go with me to the next verse, in verse 22. Look, take a look with me in verse 22. Here's what he says, in verses 22 through 25. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. For, here's something you might have heard before, all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news 
that was preached to you. So now we get to axiom number two. Axiom number one is a divine summons to a pervasive, all of life being uniquely owned by Christ as your Lord and Savior. A divine summons to a pervasive pursuit of personal holiness. What's the second axiom? Now we, knew, now we move from the personal to the corporate. That in the community is a divine summons that we love one another. Love one another. And we're called to give that love to one another with no barriers. When Jesus went to that cross, the sin barrier, the roof of sin, he blew away to unite you to God. He also knocks down the walls and the barriers to unite us to one another in the Lord. The world, through its scientific speculations, divides the world up into races. And we say, no, no, there's one race. Men and women made in the image of multiple ethnicities, no doubt about that. One race. One father, one mother, Adam, Eve, made by God, and we all come from him. There's a human race, the race of Adam. And we also know there's a redeemed race. That's the second Adam. Those who belong to Christ, in which there is no Jew or Gentile. That all of those differences have been struck down, that the same blood was shed for all of us, the same spirit indwells all of us, the same word has been given to all of us that we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that we are one in Christ, therefore we love one another, is the divine summons. What kind of a love? He actually profiles the love for us. He gives you three things about that love in the text. Let me just give them to you. You can look at them. The first thing he tells you is the love is to be earnest, an earnest love. Now, what does earnest mean? Earnest is... No, Follow me. Hang with me here. Earnest is a life action based upon a conviction. It is an intentional life action based upon conviction. You see, we're convinced of something. What are we convinced of? Jesus Christ is our Savior. What else are we convinced of? We're convinced that the blood of Jesus redeems all of his people. And what else are we convinced? That we are one in Christ. Therefore, we, don't, we understand there's, there are different ethnicities. We understand some people have to deal with wealth. Some people have to deal with no wealth. Some people have to deal with age, and some people are younger. Some people, what, we understand all of that. But what we also understand is this, that we are one in Christ. Well, I'll tell you, this was driven home to me. It just struck me. I'm sitting in Taiwan in unbelievable two-and-a-half-hour fellowship, with a brother in Christ and also a colleague in ministry who lives in red China. <laughs> and you would have thought we were both living in, in South Alabama, just watching us. There was no doubt. We understood we had our national issues and all of those things that pertain to nations, but sitting at that table, you could not slide an envelope between us. And what is true of national dynamics is true of ethnicities. It certainly ought to be true about colors of skin. It has to be true about whether one has, whether one has resources or one doesn't have. Those things just don't. We are, with no partiality, we are convinced we're supposed to love one another. Why? The same blood that saved me saved them. The same spirit who fills me fills them. The same mission given to me has been given to them. The same message that brought them from death into life brought me from death into life. That we are one. And those convicting truths make our love earnest. I saw one time saw a, 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 um, a bumper sticker and it said, uh, uh, do random acts of love. Well, I, I think I know what they're getting at with that. But brothers and sisters, we don't do random acts of love. 
We do purposed acts. Of, is there a need? Let's go. And we earnestly come to that point. It is intentional, earnest, directed love based upon conviction. That's why it says in the early church, even though everybody had their own title to their property, they lived as if it was belonging to everybody else. And if my brother has a need, they were selling things in order to meet one another's needs. I was sharing with the other group because they never heard this. I know you've heard it, but since they heard it, you need to hear it too. <coughs> I've experienced that. So I mean, it's so wonderful for me to be able to preach on something that I've been blessed in observing in your life. Not that, but I want us to excel still more. Not that we've arrived by any means, but I have watched it. I have watched your earnest love. I've been the, I've been the beneficiary of it. I, I remember one time, I was early on when I was here, and Cindy had a uh, an issue that needed to be handled surgically, well, no shortage of doctors to call on. And uh, so there we were, and, um, and everything was moving ahead. Then there was a little bit of a problem afterwards that had to be dealt with. And so I was kind of, uh, you know, trying to fend for myself, which is not too good uh, in my house. Thankfully, the kids were up and gone. They weren't suffering because of it. And uh, so, you know what, I, I, next thing I know, I've got meals showing up everywhere. I mean everywhere. And so I came here that Sunday. This was way back. It's almost 17 years ago. And I, I came here that Sunday and said, thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all. Hold on. That's enough. My Scots-Irish uh, Celtic background, I'm too frugal to throw it away. And now, uh, with all of your love, now I got to go out and buy a freezer. Thank you. When I got home that day, the freezer was already there when I got home at 1 o'clock. I, to this day, I still don't know who did it. I still don't know who did it. And there it was. So as I rejoiced in the Lord, I came back that next Sunday and said, thank you all. I said, I, I, I didn't mean to tell you to buy me a freezer. I just mentioned that I was going to have to get one. I needed one. And boom, there it was. <laughs> then that Sunday, I mentioned, you know, I've been thinking about a Mercedes Benz recently. <laughs> and... Uh, But folks, I, I, I know it's there. It's there in you because you know the Lord. But that earnest out of conviction of who I am in Christ, who they are in Christ, what we have together in Christ, the need is enough. And the second thing he says is not only is it earnest, he says it is heartfelt. Now, you know, you can't have a heartfelt love until you get a new heart. What he's saying is this isn't something cosmetically done outside. This is something coming from the inside. It's coming from the inside out. Why? Because not only do you have a prepared mind, you've got a purified soul. And that soul that's being purified by obedience to the truth, that soul is at work. And therefore, there is a heartfelt, I want to do this. I'm not looking for notice. I'm not looking for payback. I'm not doing, remember that first, this is 1 Corinthians 13 love that we just confessed. Not rude, not arrogant, not looking, not looking for its own, not, not loving to get love back, uh, not uh, loving because I got to catch up on a list or make somebody to create a list and manipulate them or what they're going to do for me. No, it's earnest and it's heartfelt. My joy is just having the privilege to love you. Thirdly, not only is it a, not only is it earnest, not only is it heartfelt, but thirdly, it is sincere. Now, that's an interesting Greek word. When you work its way back, it basically means, and I'm doing a little bit of, uh, doing a little bit of, of liberty here, but it basically means no wax. Sincere. What do you mean no wax? Well, another way to say it would be without hypocrisy. It's not, I'm doing this, but I'm just putting a mask on. That's not really what I want to do. But I'm just doing it because I know if I do this, a lot of people are going to talk about me. And, and I know you'll talk, and I know what it might, no, no, no mask. You're not playing a game. You're not playing a role. Why no wax? Well, you see, back then, back then, if you, let's say you had a statue or a bust that fell and broke, <laughs> Well, it's worth a lot of money. What are you going to do? Well, there's a whole group of people that could have taken that bust back then, put it back together, 
And then after they got it back together, and uh, they would, around the edges, put in wax. And they were experts, so it looked like nothing had ever happened to the untrained eye. And then they would put a finish on it and then sell it full price. Full price. In other words, it was fraudulent. This is telling us we don't bring fraudulent love. We don't bring love that's an act of fraud. It's something from the heart inner, with um, an earnest desire of what it will accomplish for the need, sincere. Now, how do you have love like this? He says there's two prerequisites. See, I, I just had these, all these graduates in here and their parents in the first service, and I said to them, you know, some of you are going to the military, some of you are going to gap year, some of you are going to college, and this graduation is very important. It's a prerequisite to this next step. And then some of you going to college, you're going to get a major, and there's a class that you've got to have, but you find out there are three classes that are prerequisites. There are two prerequisites in the text to get this kind of earnest, sincere, heartfelt love among the brethren that the world looks at and marvels at. Prerequisite number one is a purified soul. That word purified means cleansed. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus and cleansed by what? Notice what it says. Look at that, look at that verse. Look at verse 22. P having a soul purified by what? Obedience to the truth. Not just knowledge of the truth, but the truth that you know. You got to get the doctrine. Without doctrine, you can't have doxology. Without doctrine, you can't have discipline. Without doctrine, you can't have devotion. Now, you can have doctrine <coughs> and not have doxology and devotion and discipline, but you can't have devotion and discipline and doxology without doctrine. Now, you know the Bible and it not make any real difference, but you can't make a difference in praise to God and loving one another in the manner that is being described for us without knowing the truth. A soul cleansed, not only by the blood of Jesus, but the washing of the water of the truth with obedience. Obedience begins to cleanse our soul. And when our soul gets cleansed, then sincerity, earnestness, and heartfelt love, the gates become open. The second prerequisite, not only is there a purified soul, but the second one is you got to be born again. Do y'all, I know every one of you remembered that last point that I made last week that to be able to pursue holiness, you got to be a Christian. Same thing's true about this axiom. <laughs> to be able to love like this, you got to be a Christian. Now, you make some Christians that fall short of it, but to be able to do this love, you can't have a heartfelt love until you get a changed heart. You can't get earnestness until you get a changed direction. You've got to be born again, because when you get born again, by the grace of God, when you're born again, that, that when you're born again, then what happens? You get a new record. You get a new heart. You get a new life. You get a new home. You get a new perspective, and you get a new family. We all have the same Father, same Savior, and we're family. We're brothers and sisters. Blood bought, spirit brought, brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of us older, some of us younger. Some of us paler, some of us darker. Some of us have been entrusted with these resources, and some of us are entrusted with this amount of resources. Some of us have bigger families, some of us have smaller families. Some of us are single, some of us are married. But here we are, brothers and sisters in the Lord a part of the forever family of God, and we were born again into it. And how did we get born again? So can I give an advertisement for next week? <laughs> now, my next sermon will be to come back to this piece right here. 
This notion of being born again is so powerful in the Bible. I'm just mentioning it now as a prerequisite, but I want to go just a little deeper with you because if some of you are sitting there and says, wait, this says I am born again, not by perishable seed, but imperishable seed. What is that imperishable seed? The living and abiding Word of God. Wait a minute, Harry. I've read the Bible in the Gospel of John, and Nicodemus was told that you're born again by the Spirit. This says you're born again by the Word. Which one is it, Harry? Well, the answer is both. The Spirit of God always works with the Word of God, and the Word of God profits when the Spirit of God is there. So you are born again by a sovereign God when He sovereignly brings His Word through His people to you, and the Spirit of God gets joined to that Word, and you and I get brought from death unto life in Christ. We are made anew in Christ. We are new creations in Christ. We're not born again by perishable seed. You remember the, a while ago he said you were redeemed. In the previous paragraph it said you were redeemed not by what is perishable but imperishable. You're not redeemed with gold and silver. and pre- You're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Well, this is saying the same thing. You're not redeemed by the perish. You're never going to get redeemed because of where you work. You're never going to get saved because of where you live. You're never going to be saved because how big or how small your house is. You're never going to be saved by how rich or how poor you are. You're never going to get saved by what the world says about you or doesn't say about you. You're going to be saved not by those temporal things that are perishable. You're saved by what lasts forever, and the Word of the Lord abides forever, and it's that Word that's preached to you, the Word of God, the glorious point of the spear or the point of the sword of truth is good news. We who are helpless and hopeless A Savior has come to redeem us, and we have everlasting life in Him. And that's what causes our lives when we're born again to take on a whole new, not the perishable, but the imperishable. Brothers and sisters, when I was uh, very young, uh, I was exposed to a missionary who the Lord blessed, seemingly not at first. He and his companions went to evangelize. I've I've actually, well, let me put it this way. They went to evangelize in South America, and uh, it was there that they were all killed uh, by the Aka Indians. So you know what happened? Their wives came after them. 90 percent, 85 to 90 percent of those Aka Indians today are believers. I actually was with the son of the man who killed Jim Elliott. I remember floating down the river with him, praying that it wasn't going to be like father, like son. (laughs) And he began to tell me of what the gospel did when Elizabeth Elliott followed the death of her son in ministry there. And we've had the family here, so you know most of that story. But you know what lies at the base of that? Here's what Jim Elliott said. One life, it will soon be past. Only what is done for Christ will last. The things of this world do not make our life which are perishable. It is Christ that makes our life. And that's how we handle the things of this world. So let me give you this in closing, a takeaway. It's pretty simple. This is, it should, it's not surprising because at the, at the first Lord's Supper, Jesus, Peter is giving us an exposition of what Jesus said to them. A new commandment I have given to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's what Peter has been expounding. One of the marks, one of the axioms of the church is not only when the truth guides us to Christ and we pursue uniqueness that we belong to Him alone in this world, but now corporately we together love one another, and the same Jesus that told us the truth would set us free to be His and follow Him now tells us, follow me and love one another the way I, I loved you relentlessly. I loved you, un, I brought an unmerited, relentless, unstoppable love to you. Now, you bring that to each other. That's what I want you to bring to each other. It's not rude. It's not arrogant. It doesn't seek its own. You bring that love into each other's life because I am yours and you are mine. 
You bring that love because number one, you've been born again. You can't do this love until you're born again, but brothers and sisters, if you're born again, what I'm saying is resonating in your heart right now. You can't do it unless you're born again. So today, if you're here and you haven't come to Christ and He's stirring your soul, please come up here and talk to someone and pray with someone about a commitment to Christ. They'll be up here on both sides of this, of this platform. Come to Christ. If He is moving and that new heart is rising, then you come to Him just as you are. And watch what He does in your life. You can't love like this until you've known the love of Christ and you've been born again. But if you've been born again with the love of Christ, what I am saying is resonating. You must love one another. You want to. You can't help yourself for wanting to love one another earnestly, sincerely, heartfelt. And it's not only because you're born again. It's because we see each other differently. I remember the time Martin Lloyd-Jones was headed uh, to a a Christmas thing. He was a new Christian, and he knew the Salvation Army was going to be there with placards about Jesus and playing all out of tune their their instruments. And he was up in the. He was a, he was a very effective, uh, wealthy, well known doctor, and he was so embarrassed about it because everybody knew he's a new Christian. They're going to walk by there, and he walked by there as they played off tune, off everything. <coughs> but yet talking about Jesus with these glorious smiles, and he sat down, and he looked at his wife, and he said, those are my people. I'll never be separated from them again, nor ashamed of them. They love Jesus. I love them. We see each other differently, not on the distinctions of the world, not those distinctions, color of skin, social status, pedigree, influence. We see each other in Christ and for Christ. And not only do we do it because we're born again, and not only do it because we're different, we do it because we see each other differently, and we have been made different. Because we're born again, we want to love. Until you're born again, you can't love one another with an earnest, sincere, heartfelt love. But once you're born again, then you are compelled and you want to love one another because we're family. We're family. And I won't tell you the year. I, I was turning 40. You probably do the math, but... I was turning 40, and I decided I was going to run a marathon. Probably the stupidest decision I've ever made in my life. I got out of it a towel with the four hours and 28 minutes on it, and I don't even look at that towel any, any longer. And I also got knee surgery and probably another one in the future. So, and I, that's how stupid I was. I not only did it when I was 40, I came back and did it again when I was 41. That's really stupid, did but I remember doing it, and I remember getting my dad after I'd done some training for it. I got my dad, and my dad used to, would go with me, you know, like if it was a basketball game I was going to be playing, we'd go to the gym the day or the night before and talk about the game. Or if it was a football game, we'd go to the football field, the gridiron, or if it was a baseball game, which would be more than likely, we'd go to the diamond, we'd talk about it, and he'd encourage me, and son, you need to do this, and you need to do that. And then I said, well, dad, you want to, I'm going to be doing this tomorrow. Would you like, let's ride the course tonight. Let's eat some spaghetti. I think if you eat spaghetti, that means you'll finish. Uh, let's eat some spaghetti, and let's ride the court. He said, sure, son, I'll ride with you. So we rode. And about the time we got to mile 17, he looked at me, and he said, son, are you an idiot? <laughs> what are, he said, we done changed time zones three times. He said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And I said, well, that wasn't an, exactly an encouraging moment for me. And then I got to the race, and I got all ready, and I was hyped up and ready to go. And the first two miles, unfortunately, are downhill, and you think it's a lot easier than it's going to be. And I'm going downhill. Of course, about halfway down the hill on the left-hand side is the McEwen Funeral Home, and about 11 men, all in blue suits, are out there taking names <laughs> as we're running by. And then we get down, and uh, we go through the whole thing. But I remember my family. I remember my, uh, my wife. My two daughters, who 
run so well that it actually paid for their education, but they're still able to cheer me on while laughing probably at the same time. And then my sisters and my dad and my mom, and they would all be there cheering, and they'd get in a car and ride on ahead, and I'd come by, and they'd cheer, and then ride on ahead, and I'd come by. Well, after we got past about mile 16, they no longer got in a car and rode on ahead. They just ran ahead until I'd catch up to them. And, um, and that's the way, but they were there to encourage me because we're family. That's what we are. And then I came back. Remember that two miles downhill? That's where you ended. This time it's two miles uphill. You have no idea how many times I wanted to quit. And then one of the guys I played ball with was doing a, he actually drove an, he was an emergency medical technician and driving an emergency medical vehicle. And he came by and he, he said, hey, Ike. I said, hey, Doug. And he rode by and, and then he turned around and came back and pulled alongside of me. And he said, are you doing all right? I said, yeah, I'm doing fine. He said, you don't look too good. Well, that wasn't an encouragement, but my family was encouraging me. And my daughters got out. They ran alongside of me, taking turns, because I was about to quit. <laughs> and these girls that could run like the wind were trotting with a turkey, but they were right along. And then my sisters. This last week, I was remembering my oldest sister, best friend, <laughs> who went to be with the Lord a year ago this week. But I remember her actually getting off the curb. And that last half a mile, she said, don't stop. And she ran in with me. We're on a journey. We're on a marathon. And you don't go alone. The Holy Spirit will be with you. And we go together. Let's love one another with a sincere heart, an earnest desire, heart felt. Let's pray. Lord, would you speak to our hearts now? If there are some here who this very first prerequisite, they want to be born again, would you have them come and pray with someone, knowing that Jesus has died for them and is ready to receive them, and we don't have to go get better to be loved. While we were still enemies, Christ loved us and died for us at the right time, and now's the time to come to Him. You just come up here and pray with someone. And Father, for those of us who know You, would you so work in our lives, not only that we would pursue a pervasive walk with you governed by holiness, looking to the coming of our Savior, killing our sin, and walking in the glorious love of Christ informed by the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. And then, would you make us and call us and empower us and enable us to love one another that the world would marvel and want to know about the one who loves us, that they might know the love of Christ, having seen it in us with one another. In Jesus' name, amen.